Hi, everyone. We're just waiting to make sure that our live is going through. We want you guys to all be able to join us. So hang on with us for just one moment. I don't see it yet. Let me just. Okay, it says we're live. Okay. Give us one second. Oh, there we go. Okay. We're here. All right. Wonderful. All right, guys. So today we are excited to continue our interview series, Conversations from the Cottonwoods. Um, my name is Allie. I'm Conservancy Associate here at Teaneck Creek. And today I'm going to be moderating our roundtable. Uh, so the purpose of today's program is to explore nonprofit and local government partnerships. Uh, so we have with us today six different nonprofits, each of which work in coordination with government in a variety of different ways. Uh, so we're going to be having a couple questions for them. And then at the end, there's going to be the opportunity for a Q&A. So if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them on Facebook. We would be happy to answer them. So joining us tonight from Tina Creek, we have Alexa Fantacone. We also have Captain Bill Sheehan from Hackensack Riverkeeper. We have Peter Dolan from New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. We have Steve Wisner from Flat Rock Brook. Debbie Davidson from Tenafly Nature Center and Violet Reed from NEPO. So just to get us started off, I'm going to have each organization give just a brief description of what their mission is, what their role within the organization is, and then what level of government they interact with. So Bill, would you be willing to start us off? Um. I'm sorry, I was just- <laughs> No, that's okay. I, I was lost in the uh, conversation that was going on on the screen here. Uh, something about Steve's-, okay. Steve's uh, Oh, we lost Steve, okay. And again, but he that's was and he was muted. Uh, all, right. all right, so the, we're on the first question. Yes, would you be willing just to give us a brief overview of your organization's mission, what you do with or, within your organization, and then oh. also just real quick, how you work with local government? All right, well, I am the Hackensack Riverkeeper. That's my job, and that's the name of my organization. Uh, I founded the organization in 1997 with a mission to protect, preserve, and restore the natural living and recreational resources of the Hackensack watershed. Uh, you know, in 1997, that wasn't the most popular idea. Uh, a lot of people thought that the river was uh, beyond any help, and, you know, they referred to it more often as an open sewer, you know, but we proved them wrong, you know, we proved them wrong. And the way we did it, uh, you know, there was definitely a lot of interaction with government in order to make this happen. You know, like Riverkeeper, we could have done everything we wanted with our lawyers and the courts, but we wanted, we didn't want to go down that road because that takes a long time and it's very expensive. And then you know, when you go to court, it's like rolling the dice. You, you know, if you get a bad judge, you're done. So, uh, you know, striking up relationships with county executives, uh, both in Hudson and Bergen County, uh, has paid dividends for my organization because uh, in 1999, I opened my first paddle center down in Secaucus at a county park. And all I, you know, I had been talking up and down the river to different towns and to different, uh, people that would listen about the idea of being able to, you know, just go down to the Hackensack River and rent a boat. Mm -hmm. uh, simple act that you can do just about anywhere in the world. You can always find a boat to get on somewhere, but the entire Hackensack River from source to bay, you couldn't do that, you know, unless you went off, off campus somewhere and brought a boat in, you weren't doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, in 1999, I went to uh, Tommy DeGeese, no, actually, it wasn't even Tommy. He wasn't even a county executive yet. I went to the county executive in Hudson and I said, wouldn't it be great if we could just like rent some canoes and kayaks out to people down at Laurel Hill Park? And he was like, that's why we built that park. Yeah, of course I want to do that. And immediately rolled out the red carpet for us and, you know, set up a cage for us to store our boats and uh, never charged us a dime rent on the place. You know what I mean? Like, uh, Whatever we raise on those boat, you know, on those boat rentals, it sticks to us. You know what I mean? It's not going into much overhead. And that set us up, you know, in the long run, that set us up for our success down at Overpeck Park. Because Bergen County, being, 
I was always involved with Bergen County politics to a certain degree. Uh, I was with the original team that put together the Bergen County Open Space Trust Fund uh, back in 1998, 1999. There was a huge political uh, gambit that went on and we got the voters to approve it. And I've served on that Open Space Trust Committee since 1999 when it was formed. Wow. Uh, seeing you know, a lot of people's dreams come true because there was money available makes all of that worthwhile, you know? Absolutely. Uh, amazing. You, know, go, yeah. you go to a town where there, you know, where there was a vacant lot and all of a sudden it's a park and there are people in there with their kids and they're having a good time. It, it's very fulfilling work, you know, from my perspective. And it also set me up because we were running our paddle center down in Sea Caucus for all those years. And when they finished the Overpeck Park rehab over there in the Teaneck Ridgefield Park mm -hmm. section, they came to me and said, would you like to do this? And I would be like a fool to say no. And that, tur and that turned into a really important uh, revenue driver for my organization, especially during the summer. You know, when, when everybody's out of school, oh, wait a minute, people don't go to school anymore, right? Um, <laughs> but when, they, when they're out looking for a good time in the outdoors, usually starts in the spring, goes right through the fall. Matter of fact, we only closed our our last weekend of service at Overpeck this year was this past weekend. Wow. So and now the boats are in storage for the winter and you know all of our part-time staff are back to school and back to uh, whatever else they do with their life when they're not hanging around with Riverkeeper, you know? So, you know, it, it, it all has to do with these relationships that you build, you know, like, uh, you know, there's like all these old sayings about, you know, all politics is local. Well, it is. And, you know, when they realize that we're working, when I, I'm using the Royal we here, including all of you, when we're working, we're working for the public good, you know, and it, getting them to understand that we are not the enemy, we are their friends, and we're going to make them look good is a real big part of the magic that we all have at our fingertips. Yeah, 100%. That was wonderful. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to turn over to Peter. Could you just tell us a little bit about New York, New Jersey, New, Nor <laughs> sorry, New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, what their mission is, also what you do within the organization, and just a little bit about what level of government they interact with. Sure, it is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> yes, <laughs> sorry. My job is pronouncing the full title. <laughs> Um, but the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference is a volunteer powered organization that builds, maintains and protects public trails. And as of this week, we've officially entered our 100th year as an organization after starting in 1920. So that's very exciting. And the months ahead are going to be celebrating that achievement and making sure that we've got another 100 successful years ahead of us. And my personal role in the Trail Conference is Trail Program Manager, which means I directly manage our New York and New Jersey program coordinators, as well as our full time professional trail builder staff to make sure that on the ground projects and partnerships are executed successfully across the 2,200 miles of trail that we're active on. And I also work directly on anything pertaining to long distance trails like the Appalachian Trail, Long Path, Highlands Trail, any interstate partnerships like the Palisades Interstate Park Commission or um, Appalachian Trail Conservancy, anything that's overly technical like permits, partnership agreements, comprehensive trail planning documents, and anything that'll be a, kind of a big bureaucratic time sink, the program coordinators can toss up to me. And as for government involvement, while I do personally work in some county municipal matters, especially when it comes to contracts and memorandums of understanding, most of my cooperative work is alongside state and federal partners. So less with politicians and lawmakers and a lot more with National Park Service or state park staff who are responsible for project planning and implementation. Absolutely, so a lot of the behind the scenes making things work. That's great, mm -hmm. wonderful. Um, Steve, would you also be willing to tell me a little bit about Flat Rock Brook, your role, and then what level of government you work with? Uh, sure, Allie, thank you. Um, yeah. yeah, so Flat Rock Brook Nature Center is a 150-acre preserve in Englewood. Um, we are a, a membership organization, so we, we rely mostly on donations from private members. Uh, we have three and a half miles of trails that we maintain and environmental education programs that serve several thousand people a year. Um, 
Well, my role in the organization is uh, I'm the executive director, so I'm responsible for managing uh, a, a professional staff, uh, working with the board of trustees to make sure we have the money raised to keep the place going, um, to uh, work with uh, community outreach to kind of be the face of the organization out in the community, um, you know, putting the best word forward about our organization um, and really just making sure the place runs and being sort of the hub between the staff and the board, um, you know, which is really my main role. Uh, Flat Rock's relationship with the with government is, is a little interesting. Um, it originally started as the uh, Anglewood Nature Association back in 1973. So we're about in our 48th year right now. Um, at that time, it was pretty much a city entity, a municipal government entity. It was run by uh, somebody in City Hall of Englewood. Uh, so after a few years, even before we had a nature center building, we had the trails. Eventually, uh, the nonprofit Englewood Nature Association became the Flat Rock Brook Nature Association. And then we started severing our relationship a little bit with the city, becoming our own little nonprofit organization. That being said, um, 75 of the 150 acres are municipally owned. So we, we have a lease agreement with the city of Englewood uh, through 2036 right now. We, we sign these 25 year lease agreements, a uh, dollar per year. So we're paid up through 2036. And um, Basically, we were managing city property. So the relationship with the municipal government is interesting because we, as a nonprofit organization, manage two thirds of the recreational open space in the city of Englewood that's with really no oversight at all from the city of Englewood. And I think that's good yeah. for us to be managing our own affairs. It's also good for the city of Englewood because they couldn't possibly manage the land to, to the way that a nonprofit organization with a professional staff and with a board of trustees of 30 people could really take, uh, you know, take control over the property and make sure that the best decisions are being made. So it's a win-win. It's good for the Nature Association to have our private nonprofit. It's good for the city of Englewood because they don't have to manage all this open space that really they wouldn't be, they don't have the expertise to do so. Um, so, you know, but, but, but it's a balance. Sometimes we lean more towards wanting to have this good relationship with the city of Englewood. They help with our snow plowing. They help with our garbage. They, they pay our insurance. You know, so, so that's some of the good part uh, about having a relationship with the municipal government. Uh, you know, but sometimes we were very happy to be a private nonprofit organization with our own board making our own decisions. Um, we do not so much as Captain Bill or the other groups work with county government. We do get funds from the Bergen County Open Space Trust Fund. Mm -hmm. We get state funds from Green Acres. So our relationships with the county uh, is more on the funding side and, and with the state, not so much on the policy and advocacy side, just mm -hmm. the nature of our, of our organization. Uh, but it's really important and I see a part of my job is to make sure that we have good relationships at all levels of government um, Englewood's a weird city in some ways. It's very political. There's a lot of factions, but like Flat Rock is one of the few entities that everybody in Englewood seems to like, and it's my job to make sure it stays that way. So, uh, it's wonderful. Yeah, it's so interesting it's, hearing about how nonprofits are so essential in the role of creating public spaces like parks and nature centers. That's awesome. Thank in that you. same vein, I'm actually going to turn next to Deb. Can you tell me a little bit about Tenafly Nature Center, your role, and what level of government you guys work with? Absolutely. So similar to Steve, the Tenafly Nature Center works primarily with um, our local municipal government. Um, so the Tenafly Nature Center is a private nonprofit nature center. Um, we oversee about almost 400 acres mm -hmm. of property uh, within Tenafly bordering Alpine and Creskill. And we've been around since 1961. So next year's actually our 60th anniversary, our diamond year. So we're hoping to have a, a good celebration similar to uh, Peter wanting to celebrate 100 years with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. We're hoping to really celebrate this year and bring more of a positive message. We've, we've all been kind of stuck in a negative space 
for the last six, seven months. So we're hoping that this can kind of help the community come into more of a, a positive um, headspace and maintain a, a sane mental state. Um, so with the Tenafly Nature Center, we have over seven miles of trails that we oversee. The purpose and our mission is basically to steward that land for the purpose of preservation, education, and recreation. Mm -hmm. And so we really utilize um, our entire property for all of those purposes. The original founding of the Nature Center was done by a group of locals who just wanted to be able to um, create a nature space for education components. Um, and I believe it was initially 54 acres. Mm -hmm. Through the um, support of the local municipality and the mayor of the time, um, they were able to acquire another 275. And then year after year, they just kept adding you know, parcel by parcel until we got to our current acreage. Um, the relationship of the nature center with the local municipality, municipality has always been a really great one. The, the uh, town actually owns, the borough actually owns the, the land similar to uh, Flat Rock. And we also lease that for an extended period of time. I think we're good for quite some time. Um, I wanna say it's like 99 year Least. So we're, we're good <laughs> for quite some time. Um, and similar to Flat Rock, it does help them. The municipality doesn't have to worry about overseeing the safety um, of the visitors that are coming up to the, to the property. They do help us out with garbage and snow removal. Um, and when we really need a police presence, they're, they're there to help. They oversee, uh, they take care of our insurance just as, as well, since it is their land. Um, but we're the ones who are overseeing the day-to-day -day operations and ongoings, which has been, of course, a really big help over the last six to seven months, even more so than anything else, um, as our visitor numbers have increased exponentially. Um, we, my role is the executive director. I'm the liaison between the board and the staff, and I work directly with the municipal government to ensure that we uh, maintain their wishes and make sure that the organization and the property is being utilized the best way possible while following all of our, our all of our goals. Absolutely, that's wonderful. Yeah. And it's so interesting to hear about how you guys are working with your city. Um, next, I'm actually gonna turn to Violet, um, who's with Mevo. I know you guys work with your county. Could you tell us a little bit about your role in the organization, your organization's mission, and then obviously your county relationship? She's oh, muted. Wait, let's see if we can unmute you. Hold on one sec. All right, classic okay, yes. move. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm Violet. I'm the executive director of Mevo. We're the Mawa Environmental Volunteers Organization. We're a younger organization, so we've been around since 2008, and we were founded by high school students. Um, so we are a youth-led organization, no longer high school directed, um, more so college students and those right out of college. Um, and we're really looking to do scalable ecological projects. So things that community members can see it's happening in their community. It's making a tangible impact and they can be involved in it. Um, so that includes our two community educational and sustainable farms. Um, one of which is on county land, which I'll get into. Um, another of our programs include our Stag Hill trash cleanup program. Up on Stag Hill and Mawa, which has been profusely dumped on for 50, 60 years, um, also home to the Rampo and Nape Nation. So we've done over 120 cleanups up there at that, this point and continuing on today. We do trail work in the summers with um, the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. And Peter has been a big help with that. He, he kind of formed that bond between Nevo and the Trail Conference. So it's a great connection. Uh, and then we do beekeeping. And with all of this, we're doing education on a normal year. We have usually 1,500 to 2,000 volunteers educating about just as much in class visits and students coming to our farm, to Sag Hill. Um, so we're really here for the community. I mean, volunteers in our name. So this year has been different for us. Um, we've been focusing mostly on our farming efforts that keep us going. But as far as our relationship with the county, we are, you know, very close to the county. I'd say we are on county land. We're farming two acres in the Camp God Mountain Reservation. Um, and we started farming there in 2015. So we are in the process of renewing our five-year lease agreement right now. And when we work with the county, we're working pretty much directly with um, the Department of Parks. So we're working with them pretty often with our park manager, um, with the director of parks. 
And these are the people who are making it possible to stay on the property. Um, and when we signed the lease agreement back in 2015, it was with the agreement that you farm this land if it is open to the public. And so we strive to be as open as possible. Anyone can come and walk into our farm. Normally we have two volunteer days per week where it's open. If you are interested and you wanna get your hands dirty, you are more than welcome to come in. Um, and it's a really unique agreement. It's a land use agreement. We're supposed to pay, I believe it's 99 cents. So like everyone else who's been talking about their agreements, uh, we are definitely paid. Um, and I definitely cherish um, our relationship with the county because I, I think it is unique as far as farming on county land. So it's been an amazing experience. And then we do work with Mawa on some levels. Mm -hmm. That's mostly with Stag Hill. Um, the Mawa Environmental Commission has given us funds in the past that has helped us um, buy equipment to really break down some of the larger pieces of trash up there, like cars, um, that need to be angle grinded and you need special equipment for. So we have been in a great position of having nice relationships with the county, with the town of Mawa. And it's my belief that it's a not-for-profit job to do the work that the government doesn't have time to directly oversee like others have mentioned. Um, so we're grateful to be in that position. Absolutely, thank you, that was awesome. Thank you all for sharing a little bit about which ways, or which ways, which levels of government you all work with. Um, my next question is actually gonna be directed towards both New York and New Jersey Trail Conference and Hackensack Riverkeeper. You can each take a turn to answer. Um, but I know a lot of people, when they assume nonprofits work with government, they actually think of lobbying. That tends to be the first thing that comes to mind for most people. So we all have kind of a unique relationship with government. Um, could you talk about the ways that your organization has mobilized to incite change, maybe through partnerships, calls to action, things like that, respectively? If you'd like to go, yeah, either. I'll go. All right. Um, well, we just had, you know, one of those calls to action pay off dividends today, yesterday, uh, when New Jersey Transit announced that they were abandoning their plans to build a gas-fired power plant in the Meadowland. Oh, wow. Uh, they're going to be exploring the renewable, the road to renewables. Wow, wonderful. That's and they're, putting, awesome. they're going to be putting out, you know, they're going to be hiring consultants and doing all the due diligence they need to do. But uh, I think we're over that hump with them now. They're, they're on the road to recovery with renewables. Uh, <laughs> but that was, and that was one of those things where, you know, I can't take all the credit for that. I can't take hardly any of the credit for it. You know, what did I do? But the group that formed around this issue was a carryover from the group that formed around the issue of the North Bergen power plant, which was about a year and a half ago. And, you know, it was like nobody had broken up and gone their separate ways yet. We just went right to work on this new power plant when it came up on the horizon. And, uh, you know, doing the kayak on the river where we had, you know, about 30 kayaks out there. Everybody had signs and banners and, you know, it made, it made a very good visual impact, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, the fact that our friends from Food and Water Watch were religious about attending all of the transit meetings. I, I, I got to tell you, I, I listened in on one or two of those transit meetings. And, uh, you know, if you're ever really need sleep, but you just can't get to sleep, you should get on one of those meetings. <laughs> it, it's definitely, I, I would prescribe that for you. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, everything we do has consequences for the community. So there's always a political, like, corner of the page that we always have to turn over when it, whatever we're doing. Uh, you know, uh, we do work with legislatures in Trenton to get things done uh, down there. And we sign on to various efforts that other groups are putting forward and they sign on to things that we want. And we, you know, we keep New Jersey going in the right direction, even though, you know, for eight years under Christie, that was a little bit difficult. Uh, <laughs> very <laughs> difficult as a matter of fact. But now we're making, we're making progress in New Jersey. And uh, I think on a national level, hopefully we'll be making progress there too. You know, come come uh, come January. Yes, okay. I agree. I hope so too. Yeah, but uh, you know, I could I could go on all night. I don't want to tip monopolize everybody else's time. So go ahead, take it out, take it over. Thanks. 
So the trail conference is a little different from some of the other organizations on this call in that we don't actively and exhaustively manage a specific property or river. And instead our organization often acts almost as volunteer troubleshooters or consultants who jump around over about 2000 miles of trail and we help as needed before we jump on to tackle another project. So for our organization, this requires a lot of discussion and a lot of triage, frankly, to determine what we can do in any given year with limited resources. And with that in mind, there are several ways that the trail conference regularly works alongside government agencies. And the three main ones, if I had to classify them, would be public comments, committees, and then direct collaboration. So the first one of those, the public comments, um, most government led projects have a mandatory period for providing public comment and the trail conference works really hard to respond to anything that we feel would have impacts, whether positive or negative on the trails we maintain. So some recent examples of big documents that we offered comprehensive comment on were the National Park Service's Visitor Use Management Plan for the Delaware Water Gap National Recreation Area, as well as the recent Bergen County Parks Master Plan. And we found over the years that providing well-crafted and thoughtful feedback to these kinds of documents is a really good way to make sure that the projects are informed mm -hmm. by people, whether they're volunteers or staff who actually have on the ground local experience. Otherwise, they often get written by consultants or experts who might have a lot of knowledge, but they might be unfamiliar with site-specific concerns. So these public comments are, can be given in person at town halls or through written submissions and ideally through both. So the, the benefits to in-person comments are you get to have face time and network with politicians and policymakers who are great connections they have in the long term. But written comments are great because they allow you to convey a lot more information and they can be easily referenced or shared in the future. So in addition to those public comment sessions, we also like um, we were just hearing from Riverkeeper, we do sit on a lot of committees and advisory councils. And these can be local ones such as just local town environmental commissions, regional ones like the Catskill Strategic Planning Advisory Committee, or statewide groups like the New Jersey Trails Council. And being part of multiple kind of government managed groups like this has a really exponential benefit I've found since you can make connections and share ideas across lines of towns, counties, and states, rather than just being stuck in your own box with the same ideas. And this shared knowledge results in better discussion and hopefully that manifests in better government policy that will actually work when it hits the real world rather than being written more on a theoretical premise. So the final one is direct collaboration. And I, I think I mentioned this earlier, that's a lot of what I do is more sitting behind closed doors and just talking about how to implement projects. So one example of this was when I was working on permits through New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection or DEP. And we found that the state's flood hazard area regulations had really important rules, things that were valuable for minimizing environmental damage when you're building new structures but the engineering and the review and approval requirements didn't make any sense for trail projects. So if you were building a steel paved bridge for cars or a three foot wide bridge of wood planks for a hikers across the stream, they both had to go through the same approval process. Oh, no. hmm. Yeah, we found that was almost paralyzing for a yeah, lot that's... of projects that are necessary. So, I mean, me, I think Violet can attest if Mevo had to go through that sort of permit process every time we did a trail trip, we would do one a year. So. <laughs> I think for years, the idea and what I kept hearing from people was, oh, you know, better to beg, you know, beg forgiveness than ask permission. And this was coming even from, I won't name names, but from park staff saying, just go for it. It's, you know, it's fine. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, I think that we're talking to the right people. We can actually push through this and change the rules. so They reflect reality better. So we worked, we started with public comments, like in the last point I mentioned, and gradually from those comments, we're able to bring together a group of people from all over the state, DEP, um, agency. So we had in the same room for the first time ever, the people who write the flood hazard regulations, the people who uh, oversee the grants that fund those projects, the people who manage the land that the projects take place on, the trail crew leaders who would be implementing the projects. And from step one to 10 of doing a project for the first time, all the gears were, you know, in the same room turning in the same direction rather than getting stuck. So it's time consuming, required a lot of teaching on all parts but really getting everybody together from different levels of government and as well as volunteers on the ground, park managers, and having that group discussion broke down a lot of the bureaucratic walls. And we were able to actually amend the flood hazard regulations to the, so the first time ever they incorporated trail specific amendments and permits by rule. So I think that, that would be if I had to recap, just saying that uh, public comments, committees and direct collaboration are the three ways that we work with government. That's wonderful. And I loved actually what you said earlier. You talked about being able to have an impact across both local, state, county, like 
all of the level, like all the levels at once by having engagement in all these areas. I think that's so important. I think a lot of our organizations do an attempt to some level, but that's an impressive one as well. That's great. So my, my next question is for Tenafly Nature Center in Flat Rock Brook. So both of your organizations work with local government in the management of your nature centers. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you engage policymakers on behalf of members and park users? Um, I, I guess I'll go ahead first. Uh, so Flat Rock Brook, uh, being that we are have this interesting relationship with our municipal government, um, the way that we engage the process is, is to just be active uh, in the community. Uh, like Peter said, it's, it's good to be uh, connected. So if the city is run, <clears throat> has a deer task force, you know, one of the first people I'll call is Flat Rock Brook to make sure that, that there's representation from the nature center because we have experience working on that issue. A sustainability task force, recycling task force. Um, so you know, basically if the city it has something to do with the environment or open space, land use, uh, Flat Rock is involved. And you know, when I started 14 years ago, we didn't really have that relationship with the city. We basically just managed our 150 acres. We kind of kept to ourselves and. And I just didn't think that was an effective way to interact with the um, with the municipality, and it wasn't really good for our members and our users either, because uh, it seemed like we were isolated. And um, you know, what I always say to people is, Flat Rock isn't really a nature center; it's really a community. It's a community organization. It's a regional community organization that is much bigger than 150 acres. It's it's much um, much farther beyond that. And so the way that we do that is we engage in all these activities. I've been on the Environmental Commission of Englewood for about 14 years as a liaison. I don't vote, but I do provide guidance. I provide information. Um, now, at the same time, I'm also promoting what's happening at Flat Rock. Uh, so people in the community are aware of what we're doing. Um, what, so that's a lot of what Flat Rock provides out to um, the municipality, but then what do we get in return? You know, we, we by being active in the community and, and making connections, we are applying for different projects, say a capital project with dredging our quarry pond or uh, building a, a capital project down at our picnic area. You know, we're engaging with the municipal government and the county uh, government to be able to get the funds necessary to build these, these you know, multi, you know, sometimes million dollar projects. You know, a small organization with a $500,000 budget it'd be very difficult to build million dollar projects, but if you're leveraging your relationships in the community, um, you're partnering with your municipal government, uh, you're able to make your small nonprofit into a bigger regional entity uh, in a different way. So this, you know, so basically when it comes to large projects, we really partner with the municipal government. We will partner with the city engineer who will be you know, helping us with RFPs and, and the bidding process and permitting. We don't have the resources in our small nonprofit to do that, but we'll, we'll leverage the resources of the city government to do that. Uh, and they'll also help with getting the right consultants. So, um, you know, we have to understand what our limitations are as an organization and what our skills are. We could get volunteers, you know, we could mobilize people, we could fundraise on a small level, but when it comes to big fundraising and when it comes to large projects, we really, utilize that relationship with the city. But to, to get that relationship, you actually have to do the work before and build those relationships. So like Captain Bill and Peter were saying, if, you, if you're only seeking one side of that to benefit your organization and you're not providing the service back to the community, then you're not gonna get, you're not gonna be successful. So it's a two way street. And I like to think that Flat Rock is doing pretty well with that now. So, um, so I, I think that's that's sort of the, the give and take, and uh, I, I really enjoy it. That's part of my it's a big part of my job is to kind of uh, be that person that's going back and forth to, to make sure things succeed. Good, wonderful. I'll go. I'm going to sound a little bit like a broken record, parroting okay. everything right. that's pretty much everybody's been saying. It it truly is about relationships, having those people that you can call on a whim about anything and everything and being able to get things done is really beneficial both ways. So uh, with the Nature Center, we actually have um, a liaison 
from the town council that's actually on our, as a liaison to our board. And they sit in on our board meetings and they're a part of everything so that they can also then relate what's going on with the nature center back to the borough. Uh, we go to uh, borough meetings, we'll have, you know, discussions between the council, between with the mayor, with whomever need, we need to have a conversation with to make sure and ensure that any projects that we're working on or that they're working on, uh, we're, we're assisting or, or we're getting help with. Um, we reach out to the green team, the environmental commission, and we, we work with them to be able to provide uh, the town and the community with what they want, what they need. And just like Steve was saying, it's, you know, we, we might be a small nonprofit, but our, our reach is, is vast. We get all over the place. Uh, we, we say that we service Tenafly, Bergen County and beyond. Um, and that's, that's really true. We're, we get people all over the state who reach out to us asking questions. And it's kind of a, a, a service to all of us to be able to um, provide them with what they need, whether it's answers to questions, you know, or, or guidance of who they could potentially reach out to, who would be a good uh, contact in the future. Um, and being able to reach out to the county for things when we need them and vice versa, it, it really does, does help us all out in the long run. Yeah, that was very insightful. Thank you. Yeah. It's interesting to think about it though, to actually take the time and like break down why it's so important. <laughs> Thank you. So my next question is for both Tina Creek and for Mevo. Um, so both organizations work on pieces of land that were originally used by the county, but were for the most part unused. In the case of Tina Creek, it was slated to be a dump site. Um, for Mevo, it had been an open field. Can you talk a little bit about the development of these spaces, like how your partnership formed, and then also any tips you'd have for replicating your model? Uh, yeah, I'll go. Okay, um, so like I mentioned, we are farming on two acres of county land. So we're at the very back of Camp Gun Mountain Reservation, if anyone has been there before at their cul-de-sac. Um, and in, I'd say like 2013, our founder, Eric Hughes-Singel, he was looking for a larger piece of property for Mevo to move into, uh, to farm and grow. Previously, we had been growing on smaller plots behind Bergen County Community College, um, at business offices, who had allowed us to use like scripts of their, you know, um, side plots of their property to farm in. And that was all going really, really well, except the demand for programs and education and produce um, was skyrocketing. And so Eric started going around with other Mevo staff members um, and even Bergen County Park officials to look at um, possible places of land to farm. And they found the space in Fairlawn, I believe, or maybe, yeah, I think it was Fairlawn. Um, and they were about to close on that space of land. Um, however, it was discovered it was kind of like a floodplain. Mm -hmm. And so eventually he went out with another Bergen County Park official and they happened upon where we are now in Camp God. And it was a perfect location. It had been a grass field for many years, a dog park at one point, um, Boy Scouts liked to camp there, but it was this huge plot that had just been um, mowed periodically and hadn't gotten much use. It was right by bathrooms, which is amazing since we have a lot of young students and people coming to our farm and it had a really like deep and amazing well. Um, so we landed on that space, but after we landed on that space, it took quite a few, even I say at least a year for, in order for us to officially have documents in hand saying that we had a lease agreement. Um, and before that even happened, there was a lot of negotiation with the county. Um, since this was a little bit different than other projects that had happened before, um, because we would be profiting in some ways off of the land, we use our produce sales to sustain ourselves. Um, but today it's been a very fruitful um, agreement. The land use agreement has really provided us with a lot of flexibility. We don't have to pay for the land, so that eases a burden for us as far as where we're putting our money. So it goes into programs instead of land expenses. And um, I think we've done a lot with the space that was formerly a grassy ply. Now we have a lot of different types of plants you normally don't see because we're enclosed in a deer fence, so the deer aren't getting in. So we're getting a lot of sassafras, different fall asters, and goldenrod that you don't really see too much in Mawa. Um, and while we're farming, it's also becoming a wildlife habitat. I mean, we have turtles and snakes and other animals um, that don't eat our crop that we welcome in. Um, so I think what we're doing with this county land is twofold. That's wonderful. Alexa, would you like to 
So if people have been following along with our little interview series, you've heard us talk about um, working with the county and how impactful that is for Teaneck Creek. As um, everyone pretty much knows, Teaneck Creek is undergoing um, a huge restoration to remove the debris on site from when we were slated to be a dump site um, with our construction debris from routes 80 and 95. Um, and Honestly, our model of how Teaneck Creek came to be is something that is completely community and um, led by those people that want to make a difference and see the need for green space in their community. Um, so Teaneck Creek started um, literally by Perry and Gladys um, looking outside their office window where Teaneck Creek is currently located and seeing a surveyor and being concerned that something was going to happen in their green space outside. Um, so they contacted the county and made sure that that didn't happen, formed a group and um, made Teaneck Creek. Without the county as our partner, Teaneck Creek wouldn't exist. Um, we are on county land without a park to call home, Teaneck Creek really wouldn't have a mission. Um, so it is so integral to our organization that we have this partnership and to develop it and make sure that, that it is blossoming and, and working in both favors. Um, obviously, I think we kind of talked about how um, it's great for nonprofits, but it is great for the county too. It is a parcel of land that they're not having to tend to. Um, and we get to do programming and educational outreach. So there's a lot of benefits to the community that if the county can't provide it, like we've said before, nonprofits get to step in and do that work. Um, so it's definitely replicable. If you have something that you're interested in doing, I think it's a great opportunity to learn who owns the green spaces in your town or community um, and get working on them. Absolutely. No, I think that's a good message too, because honestly, anyone could form a nonprofit. I mean, as I mean, some of you like Bill uh, founded your own, started it up from nothing just because you saw a need in your community. And that's so inspiring for other people who may be seeing something in their community that they know needs to be addressed, other problems and issues like that. Um, so I have one more question that I'm gonna ask and then I'm gonna open it up to questions from the audience actually. My last question, I'm gonna let any of you answer whoever would like to, but it is how have your members, donors or supporters, how can they better support your organization by being active citizens and calling upon the government? Uh, I'll start. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, Hackensack Riverkeeper wouldn't be where we are without our donors, supporters, and volunteers. Uh, you know, we do a lot of enforcement work with DEP enforcement, and people know, like even, you know, trying to figure out who to talk to in government sometimes can be, it's baffling to people, but they know if they come to Riverkeeper with a complaint, we're at least going to take a look at it and determine you know, do triage on it, like someone else used the word before, and determine if we're going to handle it with our attorney or if we're going to handle it with the uh, DEP, with their enforcement arm, or if it's something really criminal, then we'll go right to the attorney general's office, the Division of Criminal Justice. And we've done, we've done, you know, dozens of cases over the years in all three of those venues, like in court on our own, using the DEP enforcement to just get day-to-day -day things cleaned up. And then once in a while, you know, somebody goes over that line, you know, that thin line between a civil case and a criminal case. And, you know, that can be a very blurry line sometimes, especially when you're as blurry as some of the people that we put in jail, uh, you know? But believe me, uh, you know, getting those tips on the telephone or even in person, people will stop me on the street sometimes and say, I know who you are. I need to talk to you. And I'm like, okay, what do you want to talk about? <laughs> you know, it, cause that could go either way. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, most of the time it goes really well and it results in, uh, you know, a cleaner and healthier Hackensack river is, you know, which is everything that we do and say, and everything that we do all day is to, one goal in mind is that's to make sure that the river is sw swimmable and fishable and enjoyable for everybody. You know, that's it. That's wonderful. Would anyone else like to answer as well? The question again was how can members, donors, supporters, anyone like that, um, how can they better support your organization by being active citizens or calling on the government? I mean, I'll, I'll say that 
I can say at least for the Tenafly Nature Center, it would not exist without supporters and without members and donors. The only reason that 400 acres, almost almost 400 acres worth of property was saved was because local community members banded together and purchased up these different parcels to create a nature center. Without them, we wouldn't be around. You know, there'd probably be uh, apartment buildings or malls or goodness knows what in that area. So by being able to be a voice and just by speaking up, we are actually able to increase the amount of green space we have in our local communities, which is really important. On top of that, they're able to really support us when we come to local government for different projects and saying, yeah, we actually want this project to, and we wanna see it go forward. Um, they're able to, to say, what they want and us as a, as a community service organization are there and feel empowered then to be able to provide what, we, what we're being asked you know, to provide for. Yeah, and I, and I'll, I agree with that. Uh, you know, really the, the donor, you know, Flat Rock is maybe unusual in this in which the majority of our money that we receive on an annual basis for our operating budget is from individuals and donors, small donors that um, are typically from the, the region and they support us. Um, and yeah, it's difficult because it's maybe a hundred dollars or a couple hundred dollars or twenty dollars or whatever. Uh, and it takes a lot of those donations to run an operation. But I'll tell you when when things are tough in, in the outer economy, you know, when there's recessions and things like that, and then government uh, entities and corporations are cutting back, you know, having this broad base of support from hundreds of donors really makes you a sustainable organization. And, and, and the donors actually really appreciate understanding that they are the majority of our support. Um, they are really the backbone of, of how our organization succeeds or doesn't. So how well we do uh, managing our facility is really how well we do with our fundraising. So we have to have a facility worthy of people coming to and donating to. Uh, so that makes us stay on our toes because we are at the beck and call of our community because they are the people supporting us. So it's really interesting and uh, how, you know, how this inter uh, interaction is with, with our local supporters. And of course there are board members and of, and of course they're doing so many things. They're on our committees and they're active and they come out, like Deb said, to your, uh, when you're raising money and you have a resolution in front of the city council, when the mayor and the city council see 30 or 40 of your people there, they're gonna support your proposal because they don't, they, they have to get elected. And, mm -hmm. um, and th those are their constituents. So you know, have, being able to mobilize support is important for both the political side, but also the financial side. Yeah, and what Steve said now about having people show up, um, that also goes to earlier I was saying one of the ways we engage with local government is by responding to these calls for open comment and these public sessions. And, you know, while the organization is going to put out a statement and we're going to send our own letters, everybody can do that. Anybody who's part of the, you know, the, um, the local population can contribute to those. And just mentioning us and name dropping organizations that you think can help can go a long way because somebody's reading those comments and they'll follow up. So if you hear about an open space funding measure, be sure to ask if nonprofits like the trail conference can apply to those because sometimes nonprofits are locked out of that kind of funding. Or if you hear about a park trails plan, you can ask, has the trail conference been, you know, taking a look at this and given their local feedback since they're the volunteers on the ground, they'll be helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing with utility projects. Who's doing the mitigation? Have you talked to local environmental nonprofits? Um, if there's park staff who are saying that they're going to institute a new project, you can even say, has a nonprofit been asked if they can provide um, a volunteer match or a volunteer engagement component so that you don't just build a trail and then let it sit. If you bring volunteers in from day one, then they'll be there to steward it long term. And a group like the Trail Conference can provide that. So just using your voice to show um, the people who you want to be involved in these projects as they move ahead is very helpful. Mm -hmm. I think the most timely thing right now is you can vote, <laughs> um, making sure you get out there and vote for your um, representation that will support your 
feelings for the environment. And that helps all of us. If we have a cleaner environment, it makes all of our jobs easier. Um, I know exactly for Hackensack Riverkeeper, for sure. Cleanups is something that Tina Creek is always doing, um, volunteer activities for everyone. Um, I, actually, on that line, we did have a question come in from the audience asking if we are seeing an increase in garbage around because of COVID. And I can say at Teaneck Creek, we definitely saw masks and gloves being littered all over. Um, so have, making sure that there is you know, regulations in place in your own neighborhood um, for things like recycling and, and garbage pickup and making sure that that's something you're voting for um, is very important. So be civically engaged so that you can support the organizations in the way that we need them and for the better health of the overall environment, not maybe individually for our organizations, but wholesome. <laughs> mm -hmm. You bet. I actually don't see any more questions from the audience, but I'm gonna give anyone a couple seconds if anyone is typing anything in and wants to ask any last minute questions. We're just about done. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we're gonna wrap up, but let me just see. No, I don't see any additional ones yet, but thank you guys all for being a part of this and for, and for contributing. It was very eye-opening and very inspiring getting to listen to all of you, how you help your community, your environment through your work. And I'm really happy to have you guys here. Um, so on next Tuesday, Alexa and I are gonna be continuing our conversations from the Cottonwoods. We'll be meeting with Benjamin Franklin Middle School teacher and also principal. So please tune in for that next time. All right. Thank you guys. Thanks for partnering thank with us, you guys. Oh. Teamwork makes the dream work. We love mm -hmm. having partners like you all. Thank <laughs> all right. you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you for inviting me. Bye. Yeah.